name is Daniel Gallagher, and I would like to thank Professor Howard for having me here to present to you guys today and you all for sharing your time with me. Um, my presentation today is on tempering chocolate, and by a quick show of hands, have you all, any of you had a chocolate bar that has been kind of had like a white film or maybe streaky ish that you bought? This is called uh, sugar blooming and fat blooming, and we'll cover that a little bit later here today. But it happened because something went wrong, usually not in the manufacturing process, but on the way to the store where you bought it. And then, if you've ever tried to make anything with chocolate, and it's either not really solidified the way that it should, that you're used to having chocolate, or it has that streakiness to it that may not have been tempered right, and that's what we're going to go over today. Um, my last presentation was a five-minute presentation that a uh, professor and his wife sat in on, and I have sheets to kind of go over that health benefits of chocolate, and we would like that. And so here we have three basic methods. There's tempering, which you would use a marble slab or something similar to, and a paint scraper, really, as long as that's all you were using it for was chocolate instead of paint or spackle. Uh, so basically, you melt your chocolate either with a double boiler method, a pot of water boiling on the stove, with a glass bowl usually sitting over top as long as it doesn't touch the water. Uh, this helps prevent scolding. Or you melt it in a microwave, and then you would pour it out on here about half to two-thirds of your batch. Um, and then you just move it around, lift it up, let it drop back down to the slab. You basically want to raise the temperature you're taking a solid chocolate and you're trying to manipulate it so that you can make other things with it, other chocolate bars, uh, truffles, that kind of thing. And you can't really do that with solid chocolate. You can't mold it, so you have to melt it first. And the whole process is to break the bonds of fat that are in chocolate and put them back together in a cohesive manner in an order, orderly fashion so that when it solidifies, you get a shiny surface and one that is resistant to heat a little bit better than if you don't temper it properly, and it'll be nice and shiny. And everybody likes some nice shiny chocolate product over one that's streaky. So your other method is double boiler. You can do it just through the double boiler. You don't have to put it on the slab. And what you would do here is you would seed it with other bits of chopped up, solid, cooled down chocolate. Um, you add that into your melted stuff. Again, raising the temperature to melt it, and then you lower it by adding in that, that solid chocolate. You just mix it up, and you should be good to go. And then you have the microwave method that was up there. Um, that basically you take, again, half to two-thirds of your batch. You put that in your bowl, usually glass, because it retains heat a lot better. And you melt it. Make sure you stir in between times, because if you don't, it keeps its shape, chocolate. And it's really hard to tell if it's actually melted or heated up to melting point if you don't stir it up and get it to, you don't disturb it. And then as it cools, it'll crystallize around the edges, and you stir that in, and that will lower the temperature back down as a unit rather than just one section of it. Watch your temper, temperature. Um, it can be really frustrating to work with chocolate, especially when you're trying to temper it. It's not a big deal if you're throwing it into a batch of cookies, or a cake, or you're making a ganache or a hot chocolate with it. You can do a whole lot with that, and it won't really mess up, it'll retain the flavor. However, this method is pretty finicky. Once you get used to it, it's kind of easy to keep going. And then your target temperature at the end, after you raise it up, is 88 degrees. Uh, we learned later that there is a varied range of heating temperatures at the max. What you don't want to do is hit anywhere near 130 or go higher. You'll scold it, and it's going to taste terrible. But there are different schools of thought as to the max degree. Some go 90, 95. Some go well into 100 and 116. If we're working with larger batches, or here in Alaska, where especially in the winter months where we want to retain that heat for a little bit longer than 100 to 116 is, is pretty good. However, 90 to 95 is probably just as fine, especially if you're working with a small batch. But then, again, with the seeding or stirring in that 
crystallize chocolate around the edge of the bowl, or by using the slab, you take it back down to 88 degrees, and that will help make the fat bonds more stable. <clears throat> different chocolate, different temperatures. Again, we don't want to exceed 130 degrees. Dark chocolate, and this is where the, the range comes in. A lot of people go as low as 90 to 95. Some take it well into the 100 degree range. Um, however, dark chocolate has less fat content than white chocolate or milk chocolate. White chocolate isn't really chocolate. All they use is the cocoa butter from the product during processing. They don't actually add in any other cocoa solids, which is what we get in milk chocolate and dark chocolate. And that's why dark chocolate has a higher degree point that we want to hit. Two degrees less for milk and white due to the higher fat content. And then we can fine tune the max temperature and the end result. If we're not quite at 88 degrees, we can always add a little bit more solid chocolate to the mix. We can always move it around on the marble slab a little bit more. Or if we need to raise it, we can add more melted chocolate or put it in for five to 10 more seconds in the microwave. The microwave method, we, what we want to try and do is shock it with the first time frame, so about 30 to 35 seconds. Take it out, stir it up a little bit, it won't be very melted at all, but then each time after that, 15 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds, stir it up, put it back in, and that'll help you with the tempering your chocolate. <coughs> um, How we know it's not tempered correctly, and this is what why we will test. That's actually the next slide. We can know by if it looks like this, you pour your chocolate into a bowl and it sets, you forget about it, or it's just not done right in the first place. We can end up having this streaking, which is basically the fat that's separated. It'll still taste the same. It will not look very pretty sometimes. Um, and it's easily fixable. You just have to watch when you retemper it break it back up into small pieces, re-microwave or redouble boiler, and then you should be able to fix that problem. And then the same thing here with the truffles. Here is not tempered correctly. Here it is. Nice shiny coating. You'll also hear a really good snap. If it's not tempered right, it might crumble and it will bend before it snaps. And then here we have the sugar blooming, the fat blooming. Sugar blooming is usually when water comes into contact, if you've ever refrigerated a candy bar, taken it out of the refrigerator and kept it in the packaging, the moisture that gets to it from the room temperature, and not coming to room temperature before you open it, um, can cause that condensation, and it brings the, the sugar to the surface as, as melted, and then as it evaporates, it leaves that sugar film. And then the fat blooming is actually when it remelts during shipping or improper tempering, it can, as it re-solidifies, either at room temperature or if you toss it to the refrigerator because you've got it home and it melted on the way home, as it really re-solidifies, it'll end up looking more like this top one because the fat didn't come back together right. <clears throat> the other thing that we want to do is keep any moisture away from our chocolate while we work with it, especially for the end stage. Again, if we're making a hot chocolate or a ganache, adding stuff to it is necessary. However, for the end stage, we want to keep that stuff away from it because it'll seize. It'll still taste the same, but it won't have the same quality that we want for either a showpiece or something that's going to sell. And then testing your temper. So there are different methods that we can do here. You have your spatula at the top or a knife or back of a spoon or some parchment paper. Basically, what we're trying to do here is dipping a small amount of chocolate so that it cools down a lot more quickly than our whole batch. We don't want our whole batch to cool down and find out it's not tempering. We'll go through that entire process again. So we have a small test batch that we just set off to the side while we do anything else. If there's ingredients to coat with, or if, there, if we are making a good option for doing truffles or anything like that, what we want to do is have this stuff ready to go about the same time as our insides. If our insides or our coatings are much colder than our tempered chocolate, then that's going to throw things off and it might disrupt the, temp the temper. Um, and then what you're looking for here is a uniform cooling. 
as it cools down, you're going to see a, a shiny surface across the whole thing, and it has that snap without having to be refrigerated um, or frozen. And that's what the proper tempering does. It also helps with heating if you're going to transport your product anywhere to the store, to a holiday party with the holidays coming up. You don't want that to melt with a low temperature on the inside of your car or something like that, because if you don't properly temper it, it that can't happen. So, what's that? That is my presentation on chocolate tempering. Thank you all again, and if you have any questions. Okay, question. Did you bring any tempered chocolate for us? <laughs> I actually um, I have to do a third presentation that's much longer, and I will have products for that. So, so you have something to look for. Fair enough. Any questions so far? Uh, any comments? I'll give you this comment. You can be alive or not. Um, in your introduction, I uh, two, two points, I guess. In your introduction, I, I wrote a note here. Um, I think to personalize this kind of thing, to put a face on it, um, it's important. As an example, I've been interested in, in chocolate all of my life. Uh, you know, today, I, I'm going to uh, prepare uh, to dip you into the chocolate world or something. You play around with the words a little bit with the message. Uh, not so much to be cute about it, but, but to... We've all been affected by chocolate. There isn't one of us who don't like it, even if you're you know, somehow um, eat too much of it or causes us to have major league acne, whatever. But, but the point is that we all know about chocolate on some level. Now you're going to take us on a chocolate journey. So when I say have fun with it, that's kind of what I mean by that. Okay. And, and um, also, I mean, there's been major motion pictures about chocolate. Um, so think about some of those characterizations about your, your, the use of your voice and tap into some of that because we're already prepared for it, you, you know. So I would say borrow liberally in a certain way from it in terms of a, maybe a little more entertaining. Not too much, but maybe just a little beyond the edge of your own comfort zone. Okay. Be unafraid to do that and uh, engage it because I think that makes it more interesting for us as audience. Uh, we want to see you be successful and as Mr. Mies pointed out, uh, and we also want to see the damn samples. Uh, uh, even if it's in progress, so uh, so take that, pal. Uh, <laughs> uh, otherwise, I, I, I liked your examples. I liked your idea of that, that particular slide you had up there about tempering. Okay. And I kept thinking uh, uh, how what, what an interesting state that is on so many levels. Uh, so uh, you're getting awfully awfully close to a, a good edge there, but I, I think. Volume thing, and one of the things I noted that you mastered uh, very well was your examples. You had a pretty broad uh, number of them, but even so, there are some more personalized examples that you could uh, theoretically uh, come up with. And so, I, I would invite you to consider uh, some of those for your next presentation. Definitely. Thank you. That would be. Uh, this judge's review. I want you to know I've been inspired to give these kind of reviews after watching The Voice. Uh, There's all my good stuff. I, I mean, I'm learning. Would I have turned the chair around? Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So thank you. And uh, thanks very much, Mr. Gallagher. Let's give him another round. Of